time of the murder. The police tapes of his ex-wife in a bitter divorce. My ex-husband caused me a lot of grief. I would never do something like that. But would the dead man's in-laws? He said, I looked into hiring a hitman and it was cheaper to get you this TV. Their hobby is hating Danny. They hated Danny, really. They hate Danny. Danny. Tonight, the play-by-play -play investigation connecting low-life hoods. Allegedly murdering a law professor. High-life dentists. I am a periodontist. And the hidden camera undercover sting never before seen. What's this? Ew. <laughs> <It's> scary. <laughs> no, don't be scary. Murdering over a, a divorce dispute? Well, that's a good reason to commit murder. If this was a Coen Brothers movie, that would be an unbelievable plot. In-laws and outlaws. Good evening, I'm David Muir. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas. Right here tonight, what police say could be a game changer in a shocking murder investigation. The gunning down of a father and prominent FSU professor. A murder as twisted as anything he might have taught in one of his very own criminal law classes. This is all happening right now with the trial just weeks away. The clock ticking for police to close the net around other possible suspects. And you will see it all right here tonight. The new surveillance video and 2020's own confrontation with a key suspect just in the last 24 hours. We're now sorting out the outlaws from the in-laws, and here's Matt Guppin. The last morning of Professor Dan Markell's life is a glorious Sunshine State Friday. At about 9 a.m., he leaves his Tallahassee home beside the trees dripping with Spanish moss with his two kids in the back seat of his Honda Accord takes his children, two young boys, to the uh, creative preschool on Tharp Street, drops them off. He drives about another 15 minutes to Premier Gym, sort of on the north side of town. 11 a.m. after his workout, Markel drives back home and is headed up the driveway when his cell phone rings. Markel starts a conversation, one he will never finish. He tells the man on the phone, oh, hold on, there's someone unfamiliar in my driveway. And as the man is on the phone, he hears some exchange, then he hears a muffle, a sound, a grunt. He never hears Dan Markell again. Somebody had walked up to Markell and shot him twice in the head. This was something really strange and was going to be a really big story. If Markell's life flashed before his eyes on that hot Florida morning, it might have looked something like this. The precocious son of a prominent Toronto family, Markel earned degrees from Harvard and Cambridge before landing a job as a criminal law professor at Florida State University. He was extraordinary. He was a gifted young man. Gifted. Donald Wider, former dean of the FSU Law School, says the intense and driven Markel was a superstar. Our second speaker is Dan Markel. A renowned scholar who commanded attention at prestigious legal seminars around the country. But the sentencing issue is distinct from the criminalization question. In the classroom, Markel was regarded as a tough but fair taskmaster. Dan was demanding of himself um, and of others. He was always exhorting people to do their best, to think independently, to think critically. And hopefully this will focus on conversation. Thanks. Markel also found success on the domestic front when he met a University of Miami law student seven years his junior named Wendy Adelson. Adelson was raised among the soaring palm trees and beaches of sunny South Florida. Her well-heeled family operated a lucrative dentistry clinic named the Adelson Institute near Fort Lauderdale. Her father, Harvey, and brother, Charlie, I am a periodontist and owner, handled the drilling and filling, and her mother, Donna, coordinated patient care. Attorney Michael Weinstein has known the family since childhood. Harvey opened up his dental practice 40 years ago in Tamarack, Florida, and he's been a pillar of the dental community uh, doing a great job for patients for the past 40 years. Tell me about Wendy. What is she like? Wendy has, is an incredibly bright, incredibly intelligent individual. While Wendy Adelson was a serious and committed law student, her best friend, Tova Walsh, says she was more free-spirited and quirky than her straight-laced boyfriend. Welcome to The Weakest Link. Wendy, Once appearing on that old quiz show, The Weakest Link. When I was little, I wanted to be a giraffe. <laughs> Is there anything else you've ever dreamed of? Well, I was in the circus for a while as a contortionist. Wendy is just, you know, fun and full of joy. She's a lovely person who has just boundless enthusiasm and energy and sense of humor. 
After a whirlwind courtship, Markel and Adelson announced their February 2006 wedding in the New York Times. Friends and family gathered at this synagogue in Boca Raton, Florida for the ceremony. It was a beautiful and very elegant affair. Wendy looked gorgeous. You know, Dan's friends and Wendy's friends were all there and celebrating with them. The newlyweds settled in Tallahassee, where Wendy also got a job at FSU as a clinical law professor specializing in human trafficking issues. Um, we had two previous clinics, and this is the third one coming on board. I think she did a great job. Very poised, capable, professional, competent, articulate. Life seemed blessed for the two lawyers in love, especially after the arrival of two children. To their many friends in the Tallahassee area, like Alex and Maya Greenberg, it seemed like Dan and Wendy had it all. We went to dinner once uh, at their house and we left kind of going like, almost oh my feeling God, inadequate. Like because they were dancing and singing yeah. and happy and they're just very affectionate. I mean, they called each other the bears. Yeah. Mr. Bear was Danny yeah. and Mrs. Bear was Wendy and that was their thing. Despite the lovey-dovey front, it turns out Wendy's passion for Papa Bear Dan had long ago gone into hibernation. In this podcast she later recorded, Wendy laid bare her feelings for her overachieving husband. thought I could cheat the system and marry a man I lacked passionate love for. Our marriage dissolved after the children arrived, as the loneliness of being married to someone that didn't view me as an equal crept in. Despite her own impressive career, Wendy says that Dan was constantly belittling her achievements, refusing to even read her passion project, a novel she wrote. I mean, he didn't like fiction, so why read my novel? It was logic, not a lack of love. Then in September 2012, after a business trip, Markel returns to Tallahassee to find a most extreme home makeover. Much of the furniture and belongings gone. The kids also gone. One of the few things Wendy did leave behind, a crib mattress on the floor with divorce papers on top. New York law professor Ethan Lieb was a close friend of Markel. This was quite stunning uh, to him. Even in his wildest imagination, he doesn't think that this is going to happen. And he doesn't think this is going to happen this quickly. Dan tried to reconcile with Wendy, but then the former contortionist added this new twist. A motion to move the kids 450 miles away to her parents' home in South Florida. And that was a turning point. I think that oh, flipped a switch in it, you know, because then he felt like, okay, I need to fight for, you know, for, for me now. Family. I think he went from, at that point, frustration to a little bit angry. Dan successfully fought the relocation, but now the gloves were off. In colorfully worded briefs, he attacked Wendy for the Pearl Harbor style separation and her Visigoth like sacking of the marital home. Then, in March 2014, Markel launched an offensive on another front the mother in law. In court papers, he demanded that Donna, Wendy's mom, stop having unsupervised visits with his kids after they told him. Grandma says you're stupid, and Grandma says she hates you. Yet in this emotional wasteland, new romance found room to bloom. Wendy started dating a fellow FSU professor named Jeffrey Lacasse. And Dan also found a new legal eagle to be his romantic co-counsel, a prominent New York law professor. And I said, you have a girlfriend now? You're having fun in life again, you're smiling a lot. You have to start celebrating those things and walk away from this negativity. And he walked away from that conversation saying, you're right. But on July 18th, right after his morning workout on that beautiful summer's day, he'll be shot down in his driveway. His next door neighbor calling 911. His uh, driver's side uh, window is shattered and he's battered and can't answer. He's inside, the car is running and he's got blood all over his head. He's not responding to me. When we come back, Markel's ex-wife is the first person police bring in. She's all tears <laughs> and fears. So I understand why I would be the person you would think would do something. When 2020 returns. The mysterious killing of a prominent law professor. Murdered execution style. Shot and killed inside his home. Even by Florida standards, the shooting of law professor Dan Markell is a shocker, a brazen assassination. 
that has residents of his prosperous Tallahassee neighborhood quaking in their tasseled loafers. It's absolutely not the kind of neighborhood where you would ever see something like this happening on 11 a.m. on a Friday morning. The scene on Trescott Drive, grisly. Markel shot twice in the head, breathing, but barely alive. So far, there are no good leads. He was shot in this quiet Benton Hills neighborhood. It would seem like this broad daylight shooting, and whoever had done it was gone. Markel is rushed to a local hospital. The cops soon locate ex-wife Wendy Adelson, who is still living in Tallahassee. They take her into this interview room where they tell her what happened. There was a shooting at your ex-husband's home. Daniel, all right, has been taken to the hospital. Um, he's not going to survive. Oh, my God. Okay. As the initial shock subsides, her thoughts turn to their children. It really scares me because it means there's someone out there that's willing to do this to him, and I'm, I'm scared for the kids. Maybe she should be scared for herself. Cops take a hard look at her as a possible suspect. She is the ex-wife, after all. Snapping a photo, swabbing her hands for evidence of gunshot residue. Can I have your phone now? taking her cell phone, turning her minivan inside out. My ex-husband caused me a lot of grief. <laughs> I would never do something like that. I know. <laughs> and, and it's good. So I understand why I okay. wouldn't be the person you would think would do something. But well, we have to work just as hard to eliminate it's people. It's fine. I want Adelson tells police she was at home in the morning waiting for a TV repairman, then went out to buy a bottle of booze for a party. After that, she met some friends for lunch. Police, meanwhile, find no evidence of a break-in at the Markell home. Somebody, for some reason, wanted Dan Markell dead, but who? Right after the shooting, police didn't have much to go on, but they did get one lead. The neighbor who called 911 from that house told them that he saw a light-colored car that looked like a Prius back out of the driveway and head down the road. You said there was another vehicle that you well, saw driving it, away? Yes, and it, it left the scene rapidly. It looked sort of like a Prius. Tallahassee police quickly begin a door-to-door -door search for any sign of the car on security cameras. Five days later, they get a hit releasing this grainy photo of a Prius. Now in Tallahassee, you know, you, a Prius and Subarus are a dime a dozen. So, I mean, there are an awful lot of Priuses around here. While investigators hunt for that eco-friendly vehicle of interest, they are also digging into every aspect of Markel's life. We thought maybe it could have been a disgruntled former student. It could have been someone who disagreed with his ideas. Nervous faculty at FSU wonder, could his death be tied to the campus? They just thought, my God, this happened to one of us, and another one of us might be next. I walked out of my office one Sunday, but next to me was a metallic green Toyota Prius, and I confess that sent a shiver up my spine. About 15 hours after he is shot, Dan Markell is pronounced dead. The devastating news spreads quickly. I shot up from bed. I was shocked, devastated. I literally could not comprehend that that had happened to him. His many friends and family gather to grieve the loss of this young father and brilliant legal scholar. Because Dan directly touched so many people, it was extremely painful. Do you know anybody that would have a beef against your ex-husband? Back at police headquarters on the day of the shooting, it seemed Wendy Adelson was off the hook. And she and the investigator engaged in talk of who done it. Who would do this? I don't know. That's why I'm that's why you're here. And that's why we're talking. She proceeded to tell police about that FSU professor, Jeffrey Lacasse, the other man in her life who she lately had had a falling out with. He didn't like Danny because Danny hurt me. She said Lacasse, who you might have noticed bears a striking likeness to Markel, was no fan of her ex. I see why he's a good suspect. 
like, what if it's Jeff? Like, then I did this by asking for some time away from him. I made him crazy. Two nights later, police asked Lacasse to come down to the station. Your name did come up of course. Uh, because you were associated at some point with Wendy. Of course. Which is Without really hesitation, the professor yeah, professes yeah, yeah. Um, his so affection for his former flame. I was in love with this girl, man, so it's hard. And she really has this charisma, this sexuality, and so, you know, you throw yourself in front of a bus for this girl. And you've never had any kind of physical contact with Danny? No. I'm surprised you guys didn't call me earlier, though, because I probably said a hundred times in public that I like to kick his ass because he kept, like, really making Wendy suffer and things like that. Right. But no, I would never. I'm a professor, and I'm, a, I'm not going to do anything like that. No, no. He tells cops he was hundreds of miles away at the time of the murder. I stayed at a really crappy day's in, maybe 20 miles south of Atlanta. Lacasse's story checks out, but he's not done talking. In fact, far from it. I have something I want to tell you, but I want it off there. I want to concern about my safety with what I'm going to tell you. Danny Markell just got killed, and I don't want to be next. I'm sorry if that sounds paranoid, but uh, I do have some ideas. Over the course of three lengthy interviews, he paints a portrait of profound Adelson family dysfunction. The whole family is real weird. Something's up with this family. He tells police they should focus not on Wendy, but on her parents and her brother Charlie, who run the family dentistry business in South Florida, and had come to think of Dan Markell as a stubborn obstacle to Wendy's happiness. The family desperately wants her back in South Florida. Mother, father, and she has a brother. They hate Danny in a way. I've never seen this kind of obsession. Like their hobby is hating Danny. Mm. <laughs> but I could just say, I would be investigating Charlie Adelson. No, I don't know if he did this. But if you're looking at somebody, don't miss him. Soon, police discover Lacoste isn't the only one raising concerns about Wendy's family. They hated Danny, really. They hated, they hated Danny. Hated Danny. Markel's friends, Alex and Maya Greenberg, tell police all about Dan's troubles with his in-laws. I think they're mean. I think they, I mean, to do some of the stuff that they did during this divorce with Danny is just not reasonable. Even Wendy Adelson herself acknowledges her parents' hatred for Markel. My parents have more reason to dislike Danny than almost anyone else. He hurt their daughter. They're very angry with him. But even my family, who felt like I had been mistreated, would never do something like this. Never. And for all the talk of Wendy's family, they were nowhere near Tallahassee on the day of Markel's murder. The cops are laser focused on tracking down that mysterious green hybrid, and for many months, the case goes cold. All that we knew was that he had been shot in his garage, that there was a Prius-like vehicle that was seen leaving the scene, and that was it. Coming up, something as banal as a toll transponder of all things will lead police hundreds of miles away, far from the FSU quad, to the bloody streets of gangland Miami. The hunt for the killers in 2020 returns. Twenty continues with more of in-laws and outlaws. May 2015. It's been 10 months since the murder of Dan Markell. His ex-wife Wendy Adelson and their two kids have moved to trendy tropical South Florida. Wendy has started a new chapter in her life, enrolling in a creative writing class. Ten months ago, someone killed the father of my children. Listen to this podcast recorded for the class as Wendy in A Deadpan Delivery first describes the demise of her marriage, and then her ex. First we got divorced, and then he got murdered. In casual conversations, I don't know whether to call him my ex-late spouse or my late ex-spouse, except that late ex-spouse sounds like latex spouse. Wendy may be talking about Dan Markell's death, but his grieving parents have never spoken publicly. They asked their attorney, Oren Snyder, to talk to 2020 on their behalf. How important is it for them, for authorities to find Markell's killer? Well, I would say it's impossible for them to move on until the killers and all those responsible for this brutal murder are held accountable. 
with the Markels fully behind them, the police leave no stone unturned in their efforts to get more information on that green Prius that a neighbor saw leaving the scene of the crime. Police have already looked at every security camera in the area, but then an enterprising investigator decides to check out the cameras installed on the city buses. Bingo! They find this video of what they believe is the suspected green Prius. Although you can't see the driver or read the license plate, police do have one tiny clue. Seen in the windshield of the Prius is a toll transponder. It's a strong indication that the killers weren't from Tallahassee because there are so few toll roads surrounding the city. Police then pull the toll records for all of the Priuses heading into the Tallahassee area around the time of the murder. When police pulled those toll records, it led them here to this hole-in-the-wall rental agency here in Miami that rents mostly hybrids. Now, inside, a contract was signed leading police to the men who rented that green Prius. Here's the eureka moment, the rental agreement. It shows the Prius was rented by a man named Luis Rivera. Using the listed cell phone number, police are quickly able to confirm Rivera's identity, and it turns out he is very well known to authorities. Police say Rivera is a leader in the notorious Latin Kings gang. Latin King organization are a very serious threat to the community. They have been known for armed robberies, homicides, home invasions, carjackings. This undercover detective with the Broward County Sheriff's Office has to keep his identity disguised. It, this is a very tough neighborhood. As you can see, it's one way in, one way out. He took us into the heart of Rivera's stomping grounds, where he was known by the moniker King Tato. He was the first crown, which is the leader for the North Miami Beach chapter of the Atlantic Kings. Of course, he'd be the main one giving the orders out, knowing everything exactly that's going on. And there's another lead on that rental contract, a man identified as Rivera's brother. The listed cell phone tracks back to this man, Sigfredo Garcia of North Miami. Garcia is no gangbanger, but he is a childhood friend of Rivera's who's also had numerous run-ins with the law. Having both men's cell phone numbers is like hitting the jackpot for investigators. Every ping on a cell phone tower, every call, every text, yields a play-by-play -play of their movement. And police say that data showed that in July 2014, Garcia and Rivera set out on a fateful road trip from Miami to Tallahassee in that Prius. Wednesday, July 16th, cell phone records show the Prius heading up I-75 on the seven-hour drive towards Tallahassee. They hit Tallahassee after midnight and check into this motel. Friday morning, July 18th, cell phone tower records place Garcia and Rivera here in the vicinity of the Premier Health and Fitness Center. Surveillance cameras capture Dan Markell arriving at the fitness center in his black Honda. Now, watch as this Prius enters the parking lot. The cops say it's the same one rented by Garcia and Rivera. Markell is then seen entering the center. Meanwhile, outside, cameras show the Prius suspiciously moving around to different parking spots. Later, Markel is seen driving away from the center. Watch closely as that same Prius follows him out. 10.44 a.m. This city bus camera captures Markel's Honda as he drives home. Seconds later, we see his unwelcome shadow, that green Prius. Markel is shot in his driveway at around 11 a.m. Police say that shortly after that, another bus camera shows the Prius driving the opposite direction away from the house. Later that same night, Garcia and Rivera are back in Miami, spotted by a security camera in that Prius withdrawing money at this ATM. I mean, there is a sense about this case that they're not really trying that hard to cover their tracks. They're just going about their business. Pretty openly. Convinced they have their suspects nailed dead to rights, police charge Rivera and Garcia for Dan Markell's murder. One of the men accused of killing FSU law professor Dan Markell is now behind bars. So what are two Miami criminals doing up here 400 miles away, allegedly murdering a law professor? It didn't seem to make sense, did it? No, it didn't. So what is the connect? There's got to be a connection between Dan Markell and these two guys. What is that connection? Well, perhaps that connection isn't a what, it's a who. 
coming up, is this mystery woman at the center of a web stretching from gangland Miami to the lecture hall to a luxury dental clinic? And did someone give her an eye-opening payoff to help orchestrate murder? Was plastic surgery or breast augmentation part of her compensation? When 2020 returns. Two years after the cold-blooded killing of Dan Markell, finally a huge step forward in this case. Two South Florida men, Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera, are charged with Markell's murder. Both have pleaded not guilty. It's a dramatic breakthrough in the case to be sure, but anchor Abby Maurer of ABC 27 News says there's still a huge unanswered question. Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera down in Miami, what do they have to do with Tallahassee? What do they have to do with Dan Markell? What is the relationship between them? Answer, none. Police can imagine only one motive for these two known felons to whack a noted law professor, money. We can provide additional information regarding this investigation. This June, police say they've finally cracked the mystery. In a stunning twist, police say they've linked the two alleged killers to none other than Wendy Adelson's family, who run that successful dental clinic. And it just so happens that someone who's on the family payroll is linked to the accused killers. It's this woman, Catherine Magbanua. Now, get this, she's the mother of Garcia's two children. And police discover she is dating Charlie Adelson, Wendy's brother. Well, it's a heck of a coincidence. It is a heck of a coincidence. State prosecutor Georgia Kappelman says investigators believe the plot was hatched because the Adelsons were desperate for Wendy and the kids to move down to South Florida. And Dan and his legal briefs were standing in the way. The working theory of the case is that the reason for this homicide was due to the bitter divorce that was ongoing. But murdering over a, a divorce dispute? I mean, what's a good reason to commit murder? Who killed Florida State University professor Dan Markell? They're looking at his ex-wife's family. Needless to say, the news of the Adelson's suspected involvement rips through Tallahassee, Tallahassee like a hurricane. Department. What was the reaction? Completely shocked. And the possibility of the Adelson family being connected to this, that just blew everybody's mind. How, do, how is this possible? How is this kind of a case, this kind of a crime happening in this town? The family had no involvement whatsoever. So far, none of the Adelsons have been charged with a crime. And down in South Florida, Charlie's attorney, Michael Weinstein, scoffs at the very notion that his buddy could be behind Markell's murder. He's a really easygoing, laid back, have a beer, relax kind of guy. Did Charlie Adelson have anything to do with Markell's murder? No. He's being looked at because of the fact that he had a dating relationship with Catherine. I'd be naive to sit here and say that there's not a connection because Catherine worked at the Adelson Institute. However, there's no evidence that he solicited any type of murder. None. But there is an almost uncanny connection that the people who were there right at the time of the murder in a car that sure looks like the car that was seen leaving the crime scene is traced back to a man named Garcia, who is the baby daddy of his current girlfriend at the time. And if this was a Coen Brothers movie, that would be an unbelievable plot. But we don't live in a Coen Brothers movie. And as I sit here today, I haven't seen one scintilla of evidence of any money changing hands. But police say they have. An affidavit released just last week asserts that Mag Banua made cash deposits of about $44,000 after Markell's murder. Police say she then started receiving paychecks from the Adelson Institute, signed by Wendy's mother, Donna, totaling another $13,000. Was that payroll or a payoff? Police say the two accused hitmen, Garcia and Rivera, seem to be spending big time right after Markell's murder. And then they both made some cash purchases of some vehicles, motorcycles, and that kind of thing after the homicide. Sam Zangane is Garcia's attorney. Where did he get the money to buy the toys that he allegedly bought because he got money for the murder? Well, I don't think he got it from Charlie Adelson, I'll tell you that. Where did he get them from? I don't know. I'm saying that there's a lot of money movement in, in, in South Florida, and, you know, money floats.
to single out Sigfredo Garcia and say, ha, ah, where did he get all this money? I mean, just like everybody else. And not everybody else is accused of being a contract killer. But prosecutors allege there was one other big ticket item that was purchased, or maybe it was two, here in this upscale Coral Gables suburb of Miami, inside this office. It belongs to Dr. Leonard Roudner, voted Miami's best plastic surgeon. His specialty, breast enhancement. He's performed over 20,000 of them, even calls himself Dr. Boobner. Police say a confidential witness told them that Magbanua got a pranksy breast job from the good doctor just three months after Markel's murder, and that Charlie Adelson allegedly picked up half the six to $7,000 tab. Magbanua declined to talk to 2020. Was so plastic think, surgery, was it? Think about this, think about breast this. Breast augmentation part of her compensation for hooking think the about, Adelsons think, up with think Garcia? About, think about what, the, 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 what they're trying to say here. Do you think my client would want the mother of his children, the woman that he loves, to get breast augmentation from Charlie Adelson and then have Charlie Adelson enjoy the fruits of that labor? I mean, come on. Between the accusations of a breast job payoff and the Fargo-esque image of Prius driving hitmen, prosecutor Kappelman says this sounds like a murder plot concocted in Hollywood. It sounds outlandish. It sounds like good TV. You might think so, too. So stay tuned, because the cops are about to produce some must-see video of their own starring the mother-in-law. She's going to be wearing green, black, and white top. Going undercover, beard and all, to try to build a case against the Adelson family. Excuse me, Mrs. Adelson? How you doing? Just want to give you this. Twenty continues with more of in-laws and outlaws. Rewind. Go back to the July afternoon when Dan Markell was gunned down in his garage. You'll recall that his ex-wife, Wendy Adelson, was brought to the local cop shop that day for the grim news. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know who would do this. Okay. Danny didn't treat me very well, and I'm so scared that maybe someone did this. Not because they hate Danny, but because they thought this was good somehow. Okay. Do you think someone would do this for your benefit without asking you? No. What good but that it, question sir? gets Wendy thinking about who? Big brother Charlie and the eye-opening comments he'd been making after he bought her a TV. Listen to this. You know, it was always this joke. He said, I, I, you know, I looked into hiring a hitman and it was cheaper to get you this TV. It was my divorce present. Okay. It's such a horrible thing to say. Well, do you think that this guy, Charlie, would even be capable of doing something like this? No. no. Let's just talk. He's a joker. Okay. But by the time Wendy related the story to her boyfriend, Jeffrey Lacasse, he says there was nothing funny about it. Remember, he planted the seed, telling police how much the Adelsons hated Markel. Here's how he remembered it. She told me that Charlie had looked into having Danny killed in the summer of 2013. She meant it dead serious. So it cost about $15,000. 15000 That's right. That's right. Had Wendy ever even hinted that she suspected one of the family members? No, I mean, she's never indicated to me any, you know, suspicion that her family members were connected. Tova Walsh is Wendy's best friend. And, you know, she, like you, like me, you know, sees the coincidence and is horrified by it, but is not, you know, it's something that she can't imagine could be the case. But the cops sure did. Black shorts. Setting up an elaborate scheme with the goal of rattling the Adelsons. This is a rare inside look at a sting operation. The target, Wendy Adelson's mother, Donna, who police suspect could have been in on a plot to kill Markel. This exclusive video shows her on the street in Miami Beach, completely unaware of what is about to occur. Excuse me, Mrs. Adelson? That bearded man comes face to face with Donna. He's actually an undercover agent wearing a body camera. Listen. You? You're scary. <laughs> no, don't be scared. Delivering a veiled threat, he's posing as the brother of Luis Rivera, one of the alleged hitmen. He's pressing Donna for payment for services rendered. And I want to let you know that my brother, he helped your family with this problem you guys had up north. He's going through some rough times, and we want to make sure that you take care of, the, of what he's going through. 
Donna's response is barely audible. Well, this will explain it. Thank you. She has the paper. They're walking away. The bait is set. Inside that envelope, police say, is a press release about Dan Markell's murder, a phone number, and a demand for $5,000. But was Donna hooked? All right, you see real contact. He's heading away. She's crossing the street. To Sigfredo Garcia's attorney, the video only proves that the investigation has become a fishing expedition. Why else would they do something like this? Because they want to catch lightning in a bottle, because they don't have that yet. But police say the ruse works. The sidewalk squeeze sets off a flurry of jittery phone calls and conversations between the Adelsons, Magbanua, and the alleged hitman, Sigfredo Garcia, all secretly recorded by law enforcement. They discussed paying the money, but never do. According to police documents, Charlie considered something else, getting the mysterious messenger out of the picture permanently, allegedly telling Catherine, you better kill him because he's going to be a big problem. If you can't do it, I'll have someone else do it. Will all this be enough for police to finally pin charges on the Adelsons? And are they headed from the penthouse to the big house? Stay with us. For police, the undercover sting in April was the icing on the cake in their two-year quest to bring those behind Dan Markell's murder to justice. We want to make sure that you take care of what he's going through. This May, police submitted these arrest affidavits against Charles Adelson and Catherine Magbanua, detailing the hidden camera encounter, the suspected payoffs, and those revealing police interviews. While police believe they have the goods to prove Adelson and Magbanua are responsible for the murder of Daniel Markell, the prosecutor says it's not good enough. I don't have evidence to charge the Adelsons. I can't go on TV and accuse them of murder without that evidence. And right now, I don't have sufficient evidence to do that. But at the very least, there's probable cause for 2020 to ask Charlie Adelson a few questions. Dr. Adelson, were you involved in a plot to kill Dan Markell? Before the shooting, did you ever discuss hiring a hitman? Adelson let the back of his $100,000 Mercedes do the talking. Attorneys for him and his parents have said the accusations are nothing more than fanciful fiction. Dan Markell was gunned down inside Apart the from the drama, it's critical to remember that there are two young children caught up in the middle of this tragedy. In Wendy's podcast, she talked about how happy they are to be close to the Adelson family. My children are thriving and happy. However it happened, it seems the Adelsons got pretty much what they wanted. Wendy and the kids now united with the rest of the family down in South Florida. But what about their other family, the Markells? Despite the cloud of suspicion over the Adelsons, Dan's parents say their priority will always be their grandkids. The family has done everything within their power to maintain a regular, ongoing relationship with the boys, including seeing the boys. Ultimately, the Markells are there for their grandkids and will be for the rest of their lives. But to rub salt in an open wound, police reveal that Wendy's had the children's surnames changed from Markell to Adelson. She said she did this to protect them from media reports. That may have been the final insult to the memory of a man who treasured his kids above all else. He would not want to miss a second of his boy's life. And for him not to be here, I think, is just the worst thing that that could have ever happened to him. A waste of a life, a waste of a you know, brilliant person, a waste of a two children's father that's not going to be around anymore. Oh, maybe those friends will get some closure as this case finally goes to trial. And tonight, an official source tells us that Luis Rivera is cooperating and negotiating a plea deal with the hope his testimony could bring indictments against others. Of course, we'll stay on this case. And another story worth noting tonight on our 2020 digital series, Young and Gifted, a very inspiring teenager, blind and autistic, but using his music and his heart to teach others that nothing is impossible. Mm -hmm. That's at abcnews.com. In the meantime, thanks for watching tonight. I'm David Muir. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas. For all of us here at 2020 and ABC News, good night and have a great weekend.